Okay, uh, if you have a Bible uh, with you, please, would you turn to book of Nehemiah? Book of Nehemiah chapter 8. Uh, I'm going to read from chapter 1 all the way up to 12. And the people gathered as one man at the square which was in front of the water gate. And they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Then Ezra the priest brought the book before the assembly of men, woman and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it before the square, which was in front of the water gates from early morning until midday. In the presence of men and women, those who could understand, and all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra, the scribes stood at a wooden podium, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Manasseh on his right hand, and Paradiah, Mishael, Melchizedek, Heshmon, and Heshbadana, that <clears throat> something like that, Zechariah, and Meshulam on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands, and they bowed low and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And Jeshua, Benai, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shebathai, Hodiah, Mesai, Kelaita, Azariah, Tozabed, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites explained the law to the people while the people remained in their place. And they read from the book, from the law of the God, translating to give the sense so that they could understand the reading. Then Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This is holy to the Lord your God. This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go, eat of the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy, do not be grieved. And all the people went away to eat, to drink, to send portions, and to celebrate a great festival, because they understood the words which had been made known to them. Amen. I've been praying about what the word of God should I deliver to this congregation that I'm supposed to come. And God gave um, a heart on the matter of revival. And I think it's fitting to a young congregation, and I don't necessarily mean the age, but um, as the church is growing, you know, we all dream about revival of church. And we praise about that, we pray about it, and we preach from the altar, hey, we want to see the revival throughout not just this um, church, but the local city and eventually the rest of the country and, and why not the all nations. So is the name of this EM church. Revival. We all love to see it. Revival. God, send the revival to us. Don't we have that heart? Don't we not want to see the God's power working in the midst of the lives of so many people, people coming to know who God truly is and experience the personal relationship that begins in this life right now, continuing to everlasting eternity. The revival of meeting the Creator God, who is almighty, who is all all knowing and who is all loving. He's everything about love. And yet, he still stands in the judgment and he judges and he rewards and he does all that 
in the light of the love that He has for us. Revival, revival. We speak so highly of it, and as we see this revival at the water gates in Jerusalem, I want us to see what it took these people of Israel to experience the first revival that is recorded in the Bible. Let me just give you a heads up on some of the details in the earlier chapters. From chapter 1 through 6 is about rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. Um, some of you know that Israelites were taken as captives to Babylon, and they wanted to come back and build, rebuild the city of Jerusalem. Okay, so it took about six chapters to describe uh, how many enemies and how many uh, times that they were threatened and deceived and, and all that to thwart them from rebuilding the wall. In chapter 7, it talks about the raising up of the leadership to rule and serve the city. And we come to chapter 8, and there are many interesting sequences of events that I want all of you to come with me to look at each one of these. Now, all the walls surrounding the Jerusalem is completed. How many days it took? 52 days. And that's a very short time to build a wall around the city. Everything is set. The wall is completed and it's safe for them to live in the city. Right? With all the enemies outside the city, they have a good protection. And they have built the roads in the city and they have shops and they have um, wells dug and they have all the things that they need to sustain a city life. So we would think, hey, they got it made now. Now it's time to really enjoy the life living in a well-protected Jerusalem. But you know, Israelites realize that the physical provisions want the way to happiness. You know, if we look at our lives, you know, we live in a city. You know, Daejeon is out here, the fourth largest city in Seoul. Is that right? Fifth? Fifth? Okay. All right. I was close, but I heard it from directly from my beloved friend, so uh, you can blame him if it's not the right. But, you know, fourth or fifth, that's huge. What's the population? In millions, right? Four or five million people? 5.5. 1.5? Oh, okay, okay. 1.5. That's about the city of Denver. Um, okay. Um, the, here is the wisdom of Israel. You know, the reason that Israel is so great, the people, is because they, they understand that what they have, uh, the provisions, uh, the completion of the wall, the safety within, and all the things like the... Uh, uh, waterworks and the housing and all the things that they have is, is not enough to have happiness in life. They realize, though, as we will see, it takes the spiritual provision. It takes spiritual revival to have a truly happy life. And that's what I want to ta talk to you today. This revival at the water gate. Right after the completion of the wall, people gather, I would presume, for the celebration. Hey, we worked so hard. We risked our lives. And we finally got it done. Let's celebrate. And that would be the mood that we would imagine. But that's not what we see. They gathered, yes. But all of a sudden, they ask the leader of their people to bring out the Bible and read. And for them, it is having a worship service. And that's what triggers all this revival. I said the external things of what we have, the city of 
대전, or anywhere. It can be entertainment that makes us happy. It can be a fitness if you are into it. We have school, library, education, and theaters, and everything that we find so important to have a happiness in our lives. But here, we see the hunger for the word of God. That's, that's something that initiates everything. Let's look at verse 1 of chapter 8. It says, And all the people gathered as one man at the square which was in the front of the water gate, and they asked Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Israel. You know, we hunger for the word of God all week long. And we come to Sunday, Sunday morning, and that's when we let everything out in the worship service of our God. You know, throughout the whole week, Monday, Tuesday, and all the way to Saturday, you know, we are to live our lives in obedience, in accordance to the teachings of God, and we preserve our the spirit and all that, our body as pure and holy, and we come on Sunday morning, we offer this living sacrifice, which is our body, and we lift it up to God. And His presence fills this place even more strongly than in our previous days in the week. And this is where we all explode in our celebration we call worship service. All week long, whatever we do, we spend the time and then we anticipate the Sunday where we come to the church. This is where the body of believers gather in the same, in the same spirit, praising, worshiping, giving honor, and showing our reverence to who God is and what He is doing in our lives. Isn't that what worship service is all about? And revival is the climax, this hunger, the hunger to worship God, hunger to hear the word of God. I, th I think that's what we miss in this generation and age. There's a pastor named Carlos Anacondia from Argentina. I'm not sure you've heard about him. This pastor, when he says, God loves you, the people that gather, they go crazy and they are turned upside down by the word, the simple word, God loves you. How much more simpler can we get? And when that word of God is proclaimed, the people turn upside down. Why is that? Because of the hunger the people bring before God. If we are like early church, which was, which fully demonstrate the God's glory, you know, we should just cry listening to the word of God, just like we read in chapter 8 of the book of Nehemiah. The word would just come as the sudden coming of the Lord in the temple, that he would touch us personally, our aches and our hurts and our emotions and our whatever that we bring, that God would descend and he would touch us. And that's why we hunger and thirst for the words. Thirst. I'm thirsty, speaking in the front. But let's suppose this. If we have a very delicious dish in front of us, and if we eat it, that it would bring all the wisdom in the universe, that it would bring a healing to any sickness, then would you not eat that? Would you not have hunger for that dish? First of all, it is the, the best dish in the world. It tastes so good. And the fact of it, it gives you all the knowledge, all the wisdom, and healing of all sorts. Now, if you say that at the hospital, what would happen? If you say that in the front of Congress, that who can use some wisdom as they run and manage a country. So Israelites 
As for the word of God, verse one, they asked for it. Okay, they didn't just sit there and let's see what's going on. Let's see now the wall is completed and we have gathered. So let's celebrate. Let's have a feast. But they had this hunger for the word of God to guide them, to show them, to uh, invite the power of God in their lives, in their country, as they recover from this destruction that took 70 years ago. I'm going to tell you a little secret. The more you eat the word, hungrier you get. In verse 1, we saw how they wanted to hear the word of God. In verse 13, you know, they come back the next day and ask for more words. And you know, I want to tell you, that is the kingdom way. The kingdom way. The more you want it, the more you will have. If you reject the word of God, what you have already in your possession, taken away. It will be taken away. Yes, that is God's way. The more hunger that you have for the words, God will satisfy you, and God will give you even more hunger, and he will satisfy you even more. That, that's how it goes. Here is something that's scary. If you don't hunger for the word of God, if you don't hunger to meet God, and suddenly God shows up, you know what, you know what that means? That means it's time for you to go. We have an example, the rich, foolish rich man. You know, he boasts about so much rich that he has. And he wonders, okay, how am I going to keep all this the rich that I have built Okay, I'm going to build a barn, and I'm going to put everything in it. But God shows up one night. What if I take your life tonight? What's going to happen to you, to all that you have? We've got to be careful. When God shows up, when, you are, when we do not have any desire to meet him, hey, that can be a very bad news. So serving God. With hunger and thirst for the word, that is a full-time job. Okay? The rest, it does not matter what you do. The rest is a part-time job. You know, God created us not for the prime purpose of having us to work, providing for the family. We do that. But that is not the primary reason. God created us. So that we have a personal relationship with God where he is the object of our worship and we give all the things and everything that we have in a form of praise and worship and adoration to God. That is our full-time job. The rest is a part-time. Do you believe that? Israelites did not build the wall of Jerusalem to just live in peace but to serve and worship God that God desires. If you look at the Nehemiah, how he began all this rebuilding of the wall, he, had a, he wanted to build the Jerusalem, the temple, so that, that God would be in the midst of his countrymen, his people once again, and to, to continue the lineage of the chosen people. What is in the center of all his desire? To have a place of worship in his country. That is the reason. This whole the rebuilding of the wall is how it started. There's another great example. Protestants. How many of you from, uh, from uh, America? Raise your hand quickly. Okay. Americans have a great heritage because it's Protestants who left England for the single purpose, and that was for the freedom. Not the freedom from England rule, but freedom to worship God with liberty. God, the way they want to worship, the way they want to pray, the way they want to have this personal encounter and continue that in their lives and for their children. That is the reason 
That's why the America is where it is, because of these Protestants. When we hold fast, God, you know, we can have everything. You can have money, you can have glory. When you hold fast to God, rich, fame, power. That's a common thing that we desire in this generation, in this society. But you know, if we have that without God, it can be destructive. When man tries, goes out on his own, try to make money to be rich, and try to have this fame and the power, it will be a destruction. Because rich calls the greed, fame calls the ego, and a power calls the pride, and they all go before the destruction. Once you have God, with God, everything comes, because God is the creator God who created all things. If we need whatever, God certainly can provide. But if we, we want to have all these things in the world and not have God, this will be a curse. We see that in the history of Israel. There's another group at the time of Protestants that moved to America. This group, instead of going to North America for the region of worshiping God and, and for the world to fill their hearts and leading them to the life that God desires, another group went to South America, but for the wrong reason. They went there for the gold, and they miserably failed. When we stray away from God and pursue the things in the world, that's what happens. We fail at the end. And the second thing that we see in the Israelites as this revival breaks out is the reading of the word in verse 3. And Ezra read from it before the square, which was in front of the water gate from early morning until midday. From early morning till midday, it means from 6 in the morning till noon. So how many hours is that? Six hours. I wonder if I stand here and read the Bible for six straight hours, how many of you will still be here? Probably not that many, right? But the Israelites, they attentively paid full attention to the reading of the word. Why? Because of their hunger and thirst for the word of God. They listened. And just the reading the word led to the repentance. We see in verse 9, it says, the Nehemiah who gave the governor and Ezra the priest and scribe and the Levite who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the Lord. They wept. Why? Why would they weep? Because in the light of the spoken word of God, as they heard the word, it entered through their ears and it went down to their hearts. And the word of God started something inside. It revealed who they were. Some of the sins, how black the heart was. Some of the attitudes that they were not rightful to be in the presence of God. Their lifestyle, all these things were revealed and they just fell down and wept because of the revealed sins. Only by what? Listening to the word of God. That is the power of the words. And this repentance indicates the spiritual level. What should be the spiritual level for us? The poor spirits, broken spirits, with a contrite heart, heart that is still that still has life, that once the word of God enters, it is not hardened, but it is tender so that it can respond to the word of God. As God 
moves inside. And you know, the Word opens up the door of prayer and the worship service. Every spiritual discipline in life begins with the words of God. When you have the words, the words, it begins everything. When you know, when God's word pounds your heart, it leads to all the right course that God wants to direct your life. So if you don't hear the word of God, I mean, you hear it, but if it does not affect your heart, if you are not moved, if something inside does not stir, you know what? You are not really hearing the word of God. Your body may be here. You may hear it in your head. But if it does not have an effect on you, you are not hearing the words of God. And if you are not, then your life is pretty much nothing. Don't let the word become a source of information that just piles up in the brain. You know what happens when you gather so much knowledge and in comparison to other people around you? I mean, you have the layers and layers of all this information through the weather, the word of God, the wisdom, and all that. What will happen at the end when, it, when the word of God is just on information? It gets over your head. You become arrogant. That is a given course. If you build the knowledge as you listen to the word of God, I guarantee you, you will be the arrogant. That's just a course. That's something that as, as a pastor, I watch out for. If that happens, I'm not, I'm not going to be a faithful steward of the word of God. Instead of let the word of God sit as information in your head, let it stir you up inside. Let it move you. And that's what the word is intended. Amos chapter 8 verse 11, it says, Behold, days are coming. The famine for hearing the word of the Lord. The famine is here. The drought is here today in this generation. There are so many words, so many churches. But the true word of God, how are you accepting that? Psalm 119, 113. I opened my mouth wide and panted, for I longed for your commandments because of the hunger, because of the thirst. The psalmist is panting. And that's the kind of the heart that we have to bring before the Lord. That's a type of hunger that we should exhibit in our daily lives. And the third, everyone stood up in verse 5. As the priest was reading the word, they stood up. Now what's so big deal about that? How many of you are parents? Raise your hand parents okay okay thank you if you are parents let's suppose let's imagine okay if you lost your son long time ago and you have finally discovered him and you are going to meet him for the first time would you be able to sit still and just wait for him to come probably not probably not that you be Standing, walking back and forth, wondering how the, why the time is going so slow. How about young people? If you are waiting for your beloved, whether it be your girlfriend, whether it be your boyfriend, if you are waiting for someone that you love, can you just sit still and think about something else, wandering? No, because the love for the word of God is so great, Israelites could not sit still. That's why they stood up in the respect of the word. 
Psalm 119, 147 says this, I rise before dawn and cry for help. I wait for your words. My eyes anticipate the night watches that I may meditate on your words. And the next point is, they ask for more word the next day. Listening to the word of God for six straight hours, the next day, they come back for more. And they bother the priest. Hey, wake up. Can you tell us more about God? Can you teach us the Bible? That they did that. Why? Because they had this hunger for the word of God. I heard a story about George Mueller. And he's the father of orphans in England. He did not pass 15 minutes without looking up a word in the Bible. Truly a man of God, isn't he? Man of word? Of God. Now, I don't think I can do that myself. But what I want to point out is that's the type of the hunger that we want to have in our lives as we Devote our Christian lives to God who deserves my uttermost respect. I'm going to get to my final point. When the word of God is proclaimed, when God's word is read, there are is certain response that we see. And I'm going to tell you the three responses this Israel shows. Okay. Now, if we, res- if we respond, that means the word of God enters into the heart of the listener. But if there is no response, then that means there was no Word of God taking up residence in the hearts of the listener. And if we don't respond to the word of God, that means we are just storing common sense or information in the head. And there is no work of life. When word of God is properly taken in into the hearts, then there is life that God brings. The hunger is the bottom line. When you have this hunger, the word of God will come inside, and then this word will move you, and then it will make you to respond. One of the three first response is the response of knowledge, verse 7 and 8. I'm not going to read the people in the front of the verse 8. They explained the law to the people while the people remained in the place. And they read from the book and from the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they understand the reading. Okay. Israelites invited this bunch of guys. It's hard to, pro- hard to pronounce their names. And most of all, Levites, to do what? To help them understand the word of God. Now, we can think, okay, these people, they could have just studied on their own. They could have just go on and, and understand the word of God. But they decided to invite these people to help them understand the word. What does that really mean? They are basically saying this. We are not going to eat the word of God according to our spiritual level, our spiritual maturity, or we can say immaturity. You know, one big problem in faith life is that we have our own version of the gospel. Whether you admit it or not, we all have our own version of gospel because of a different degree of understanding God and our personal walk with God. 
We try to bring the word of God down to our level. That's what I mean by having my own version of the gospel. Let me give you an example. The popular belief is that once you believe in Jesus, all problems in life will go away. The Bible says, you will suffer many hardships for my sake. This is not very popular, is it? If you follow Jesus, you are not going to be rich. You are going to be poor. Yes. If you are a genuine Christian, if you really have given your life and committed your life to God, Guess what? You are not going to be a rich man. You're going to be a poor man. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that later. The standard of the word. Where is your standard of understanding of the word of God? You know, we serve Jesus. But we serve the mammon of the world at the same time. Jesus says, pick one. You either pick me or God of the world. Idol out there. I'll pursue for the wealth. Pursue for the materials. You see, we cannot have both. We cannot have God, and then we try to go after another thing in the place of Jesus. God says, you can't have both. No, that's not how it goes. You either pick one or the other. You see, you cannot marry two women, right? You can only pick one. And who is that going to be? We compromise. And we bring the word of God down to our level. And we try to understand it from our perspective, in accordance to my circumstance, to what I know, to what I can figure things out. But that's not the intention of the word of God that God gave to us. God's intention is for us to move up the standard of God. And we move from where we are and to the standard that God says throughout the Bible, we can't bring it down. And we try to force God into the little mind that we have, little experience that we have. Who are we to compare to the great God? Today, many Christians want to be comforted every Sunday when they come to church. I stand here before you to tell you this. That is the quickest way to fall apart in your life. If you are not the righteous, and you seek God's comfort in your life, you are saying this. You are fatally wounded. You are bleeding to death. And you say, That's okay, just give me a painkiller, I'll be all right. When you are, when your life does not reflect the teaching of the Bible to be the righteous man that God seeks in this generation, then if you're not that person, guess what? You are bleeding, you, whether in your spirit and in your soul, that you are not living according to the word of God. So what happens is that you are somehow, you're bound by the, whether it be the world or whether it be other things, that you are bound, that you are not living up to the, the full expectation of the creation that God had intended for you. We need major surgery and proper treatment. We can't just put a bandage over it. We can't just say, give me a painkiller. That's not enough. We can't just let a 
ship insists on its way to go to the edge of the cliff because in due time, if you let it go, if you let it be, it will fall off the cliff. And the rest of the history. The second point of response to knowledge is they read from the book, verse 8. They read from the book. It means they have selected the text in the Bible. I mean, in order to read the Bible, I mean, you got to turn to some page and start reading. That's selecting a text. It also means when you select a text, it means you don't read the Bible according to your own circumstance. There is a room for misinterpretation of the Bible, isn't there? Especially when you bring the Word of God down to your circumstance. You are going to have an error. You know, disciples, the tw- let's look at 12 disciples of Jesus. They weren't called according to their circumstances. When Jesus called them, the Peter, John, James, they all left everything behind. They left their livelihood, their job, their family, everything they had. They just followed. When they heard the calling of Jesus, come, follow after me, they left everything and they followed Jesus. Didn't they? Didn't they? That's what a disciple is. You know, disciples did not accept the call because Jesus could turn them into a rich man. When God calls us, God is not going to give us all the riches of the world, but we are to leave everything behind, all our agenda, all the stuff that we carry, all that we have in this world, but we are to follow Jesus. That's what a disciple is, and that's what a Christian is. I said earlier, if you follow Jesus, you'll be poor. And that is the gospel. That is the gospel. We have to give everything up. Resources, time, energy. If there's anything that God asks, if there's anything that hinders your, rela- with your, your relationship with God, we are to give that up. It is hard, yes. But if you really want to have the intimacy If you really want to have the personal relationship and experience of God in your life, and everything that comes with God, whether it be the power to heal, whether it be the word that can penetrate into the hearts of men, and whether it be all the spiritual gifts that are mentioned in the Bible, they all come with God only when you have an intimate relationship with the Lord. Our boast should be what we give up for the Lord. For the sake of God's kingdom, for the sake of our Lord Jesus, that should be the boast. What have I given up for God? You know, we look at our prayer life. You know, it's mostly about, I want this, God. God, I need this. I really do. I really do. And we think from our perspective. But God does not think in our level. My plan is not your plan. My ways are different from yours. God says that. You know, let's look at Abraham, the father of faith. God finally acknowledges Abraham when he is 135 years old. Now, around that age, what did Abraham do? He tried to offer his only son, Isaac, as a sacrifice to the Lord. When he finally gave up the most precious being, the most precious thing that he was holding so dear to in his life, when he finally let that go, God, this is yours. I let everything go, and this is my last that's when finally God acknowledges Abraham and he earns 
the name, the nickname, the Father of Faith. Do you think God seeks faith out of just one person, Abraham? Isn't God seeking the same faith from us? Letting go of the things that we hold so dear to? Not this, Lord, but I want more of this. I just want more and more and more. And when you get so much of other stuff, it will drown you. It will drown your life. Christian is not to try to grasp and possess, but it rather it is to lay down and let God work in my life. Finally, letting things go, then you will truly be free. Free. When you have so much, when you seek so much, when you have so many hopes, so many plans, so many goals in your life, guess what? You are adding burden to your life. Disciple is the one who gives up. It's the one who has given up his goal, his experience, experience and his possession. Second response to the word of God is emotion. Verse 9. It says, they cried. And I said, means they repented. Cried, repented, go together. If we truly eat the word, we can clearly see the condition of our soul. I mean, it is something that just happens. It is automatic. That's the reason we cry when we hear the word of God. It touches our inner being, and we come to realize who we are, and we repent, and we cry, and we fall down in the presence of the Lord, and we say, I can do nothing, and I am nothing but a sinner in your holy presence, and God, have mercy on this poor soul. Have a mercy on this sinner. That is what happens. And they celebrate it after the repentance. And they cried more. You see, when the revival takes place, these two things take place at the same time. There is so much joy. And then there's so much of pain of seeing who they really are in the light of the word, word of God. And final response to the word is the determination of the will. We didn't read these verses, but verses 14 through 18. It talks about observing the Feast of Booth. It is a celebration of Exodus of Egypt. They went back to their leaders and asked for more of the word. And God reveals, hey, you've been missing out on this. You haven't been obeying this. And when they heard the word, they immediately went out, gathered branches, and they built little tents for them to live in. According to the word, they heard. Immediate response. Immediate obedience to the word. That is what happens when the word of God enters into the heart. Wherever there was a hunger for the word of God in history, in the event of revival, there was always, always, always obedience to the word of God. I tell you, I tell you, if you walk out of here and you do not remember anything about what to obey as you hear Guess what? It was just an information, and it's going to add to your knowledge, and it will lead you to be arrogant. In Korea, Pyongyang revival, the markets closed down on Sundays for the first time. Wherever Johann Wesley went in England, the bars closed down. Immediate obedience to the word of God. Folks, do you hunger for the word of God? 
Do you have a consistent hunger and thirst for the Word of God to fill you, your heart, that your empty space? Do you have a room with a yearning that you are preparing for the healer to come and touch you and restore you and renew you? Where is your focus? Is it on the word of the Lord? Or is it out there in the world? As you chase your career, as you chase all these different dreams and your plans and your goals, and as you bank your experience and all that you have, where is the room for the thirst and the hunger for the word of God? If there is anything... May God rekindle inside of you the hunger and thirst for the words of God. Because out of the word comes the life, life that only God can bring. Let us pray.